would you like to stand for the reading of the word of the Lord? Thought when we got uh, the old man on Moriah, we'd finally finished with him, but we ain't. But we will be finished as of tonight. Genesis chapter 23. Verse 1, And Sarah was a hundred and seven and twenty years old. These were the years of the life of Sarah. Sarah died in Kerjath Abarba. The same is Hebron in the land of Canaan. And Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. And Abraham stood up from before his dead and spake unto the sons of Heth, saying, I am a stranger and a sojourner with you. Give me a place, give me a possession or a burying place with you, that I may bury my dead out of my sight. And the children of Heth answered Abraham, saying unto him, I want you to listen to this. This is powerful. Hear us, my Lord. Thou art a mighty prince among us. In the choice of our sepulchres bury thy dead. None of us shall withhold them from withhold from thee his sepulchre, but that thou mayest bury thy dead. And Abraham stood up and bowed himself to the people of the land, even to the children of heaven. And he talks to them about getting this cave at Machpelah. And I don't want to go through all the rest of it because I want to get into this. In verse 17, in the field of Ephron, which was in Machpelah, which was before memory, in the field and the cave, which was therein, and all the trees that were in the field that were in all the borders round about were made sure unto Abraham for a possession. In the presence of the children of Heth, before all that went in at the gate of the city, and after this, Abraham buried Sarah, his wife, in the cave of the field of Machpelah before Mamre, the same as Hebron in the land of Canaan. And the field and the cave that is therein were made sure unto Abraham for a possession of a burying place by the sons of Heth. You'll turn over just a chapter to two chapters to chapter 25. <clears throat> I just want to read uh, two verses of Scripture here. Verse 7. And these are the days of the years of Abraham's life. I told you we're going to finish tonight. He ain't no more. Which he lived a hundred three score and fifteen years, or a hundred and seventy five years. Then Abraham gave up the ghost and died in a good old age, an old man and full of years, and was gathered to his people. And his sons, Isaac and Ishmael, buried him in the cave of Machpelah. I have one last scripture to read. You don't have to turn. I'll read it to you. Isaiah <clears throat> chapter 51. Hearken unto me, ye that follow after righteousness, ye that seek the Lord. Look unto the rock when she are hewn, and to the hole of the pit when she are digged. Look unto Abraham your father, and unto Sarah that bear you. For I called him alone, and blessed him, and increased him. I want to talk to you tonight for the last time on this uh, Bible study about Abraham. And our Bible study tonight <clears throat> is the last look at Abraham. The last look at Abraham. Lord, we love you and appreciate you. And we thank you for these wonderful people. Bless the teaching of the Word of God. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Praise God. <clears throat> I'm just going to uh, <clears throat> share just a few scattered thoughts with you. I thought after last Wednesday night we'd be finished, but... After studying chapter 23, 24, 25, and some of Isaiah, uh, I felt there was a great injustice being uh, served to you and I if we left him uh, on the mountain in the sacrifice of Moriah because there are some tremendous things. And so uh, if you just kind of just lighten up, loosen up. I don't have to prove anything to you. Just let's just let's just go through a few thoughts tonight. Uh, we have studied now for five months, 
five months. The life of one of the greatest men that's ever walked on this planet. And uh, we are admonished in the book of Romans that we are to walk in the steps of the faith of Abraham. And what I want to do in this uh, finality of this last lesson is, is kind of pull all the loose ends together and see if we learned anything. Because there's been a lot of information go out across this pulpit, but if we didn't learn anything, then all we can walk away and say, wow, we really heard some neat stuff. It didn't help us, but we heard some neat stuff. And um, we have followed this man from the Ur of the Chaldees to the top of Moriah. And now we leave Moriah to go to the depths of Machpelah. Abraham is probably the most widespread reverenced person in the entire world. He is honored and revered by the Jews. He is blessed and honored and revealed by many Mohammedans. Many Mohammedans write of Abraham saying outside of their prophet there was none greater than Abraham. And he is greatly revered among the Christian faith because he is called the father of the faithful. And we are told to walk in the steps of Abraham. Everybody hear me? Okay. Oh, this is, this is amazing. Today, in Eastern countries, the name Abraham is overshadowed by a title that they have given to him in the East. Abraham is referred to in the East as the friend. He was referred to by God Almighty Himself as my friend. Now I think that 25 weeks of studying this fellow needs to bring us somewhere. How many here would like to have God say, you are my friend? So we need to find out what made Abraham so great? Now we studied his episodes up and down, good and bad, in and out, victories, triumphs, and tragedies. But I wonder if we've really grasped what made the man so great. Think about it. We've gone from Genesis 11 and now we're finishing with Genesis 25. Have we picked up the steps of this this precious man who went from bowing in front of idols to worshiping a living God who said, you are my personal friend. Have we grasped what made him so great? You know, it's sometimes it's easy to, to read a book, study, study an, an autobiography or a biography and not grasp the magnitude of what you've just been challenged by. People just aren't great. There are no great people. They are made great. Life makes them great. Trial and error makes them great. Mistakes, failures, and success makes them great. David said one time, Lord, thy gentleness hath made me great. David said, I am great. It wasn't boast, ego, or pride. It was true. I am great. And any child of God is great. We don't look at ourselves as great, but we are in the sight of God because we're the greatest treasure on the earth. We're the only thing He's coming back for. And if you're living for God, you're a great person. You need to understand something. You have a great salvation. You have received a great calling. You have received great mercy. One writer said, great grace is upon the church. We have the great Holy Ghost. We have a great remission fountain, water baptism in Jesus' name. We are going to a great city that houses the great God for a great catching away. Everything about us is great. We ought not look at ourselves as second rate. If we would understand exactly what David said, thy gentleness has made me great. If I'm great, it's because you're greater. 
and your gentleness has flowed to me so I can be a partaker of your greatness. Did you get me? What made this man so awesome? What made him so fantastic? What is it about Abraham that literally makes him the focal figure of the Christian faith? Let's take one last look. I have, I think, three points to share with you and then we'll be finished. First, the thing that made Abraham so great he was so human that he could love. Sometimes you look at people who are strong in faith and you don't think they ever hurt. I found a scripture I read to you right here in verse 2 of 23. It is the only recorded time that Abraham ever wept. Think about it. We're living in a generation that thinks weeping is weakness. If we got some kind of stoic philosophy of you don't have to cave in, you just kind of grin and bear. I wonder sometimes if you can't weep, I wonder if you can love. Now, I think it's amazing that in all these chapters we've studied, this is the only mention where Abraham ever wept. I went back all through it from 11 to here. Think about it. He did not weep when he left the Ark of the Chaldees. He did not weep. No record. When his dad died, they buried him in Haran. There's no weeping when God said, pick up and leave all your family and go into a land that I'll now show you. That takes place in Genesis 12. Not one record that he ever wept. Not one record that he ever wept when he left all his relatives and all his kinfolk. There is no record, none, that he ever wept when Lot was captured. There is no record that he ever wept when God told him to take Isaac up Moriah. Now that's the place you think he weeps. But he never wept there either. Amen. But now, she's 127, he's about 137. And the scripture says he comes to mourn and weep over Sarah. All right. You know why? Because deep, true sorrow will always reveal the true person. Why does he weep now? And he never wept any other time. I think I got an answer. Doing the will of God, which each one of those episodes were, did you hear me? Leaving the Urichaldees, leaving his dad, leaving Haran, leaving his relatives, remember? Rescuing Lot, building the altars, confessing when he was wrong, going up Moriah. That was doing the will of God. When most of us are involved doing the will of God, the very fact that we are involved in the activity and work of faith keeps us usually from weeping. Because doing the will of God is our medicine and our strength. But doing the will of God is not the same as suffering the will of God. Now let us think. You're doing the will of God. That seems to bolster you and you just have a quivering lip and you just go on. You're doing the will of God. But when you've done everything God told you to do and then boom, God just stops your activity and He says, okay, now you suffer the will of God. And God says, give me the child. Give me the wife. I'll take the husband. Give me the wife. Give me the husband. Give me the wife. Give, me the, give it to me. When you suffer the will of God, words no longer work. And sweat no longer works. And the only language the body now knows is those mini messengers called tears. 
God has designed the body to be able to explode in tears as a valve that lets off great pressure. Tears have a ministry, my friend. Tears speak when words are silent. When you suffer the will of God, you'll weep. You don't believe me? Ask David. When the child dies. When you suffer the will of God, you'll weep. Ask Job. As long as he's doing the will of God, there's no weeping. As soon as he stops doing and he has to suffer, here comes the tears. You'll weep when you suffer the will of God. Ask John the Baptist. You're not coming out of the prison. It's my will for you to be beheaded and die. That's why there's been many times much weeping as martyrs gave up their life as they suffered the will of God. If you're not careful, you let the double brow breach you when you're suffering the will of God. He'll you take, actually take your tears and try to make you believe you don't have any faith. You need to bear up underneath it. No, you're not. That's God's release. Weep. Jesus wept when he suffered the will of God. Oh yes, he did the will of God always, but then he went and suffered it when he went to Gethsemane. And the Bible said he offered a strong cry and weeping. Oh, he now suffers the will of God. Am I making any sense here? You understand what I'm saying? Mercy. Oh boy. <clears throat> He's weeping. Because he has just lost the only link to the home of his childhood. Sarah has suffered with him from being his young wife to being his pilgrim partner of travel to going through the episode and the agony and pain of, of childless sorrow to the tragedy of the Hagar problem to the lies of being traded off to Pharaoh and Abimelech, to the ecstasy of finally being Isaac's mommy. And when he went over the parade of those episodes at that grave, he wept. I worry about people who are so strong when they go to the coffin and to the cemetery and they have to hold up and bear up. Why? But one writer says, for sorrow is love that is bereaved, widowed, and wounded. There's nothing weak about weeping. It is a ministry. Simon Peter wept when he failed. Jesus wept when he hurt. Paul wept in agony for the work. Even the Ephesian believers, the Bible said in the book of Acts, fell on the neck of Paul and wept, sorrowing that they would never see him again. Somebody say amen. amen. Point number two. Maybe we should have left them on Moriah. Now, you need to understand this. If you're ever going to be great and walk in the steps of Abraham, you need to learn how to love, how to suffer the will of God, and how to show expression publicly. Point number two. The thing that made Abraham so great was that he was able to have a proper outlook and a perception of himself. And he, we find it recorded right here in 23 and verse 4. Watch what he says. 
I am a stranger and a sojourner with you. He's 137 years old and he's not settled yet. David wrote in the Psalms and called himself the same thing. He said, For I am a stranger and a sojourner as my fathers were before me. God commanded through the prophet Moses that the land that Israel lived in could never be sold. God saying to them, I have called you strangers and sojourners with me. Hebrews 11 and 3 said, The record of those who died in the faith said this, We are pilgrims and strangers. We are travelers, according to Hebrews 11 and 4, looking for a city. I'm trying to give you a a climax to this whole thing. Please, uh, kind of let me have your attention for a little bit. You're never going to be great nor walk in the steps of Abraham like you need to if one, you don't know how to love and two, you don't have a proper perspective of what your position is. You've got to view everything that you are no more than a sojourner and a traveler. You're passing through. You have hold of nothing. Nothing is ours. You say, I own it. No, it will pass through you fingers in just a few years. I told you that one time the whole universe is in motion. And we are in motion. And as we always say, boy, time flies by. Time doesn't go anywhere. We go. Time stays. We pass through the tunnel. Do you hear me? I said, if you're ever going to be what you ought to be for God, you've got to have the concept and the perception and the outlook that you are a stranger and a sojourner in the land. That means you are constantly mobile. And unless you have that outlook, you're going to be frustrated. Because your greed will torment you. And your tragedies will drive you crazy. And when you lose in an episode, if you don't see yourself as a sojourner and a traveler, you're going to be so tormented and frustrated by it, you're going to turn inward. But if you and I can look at every episode that we go through, some you win, some you lose, it really doesn't matter because I'm moving. I'm moving. I'm constantly moving. It really doesn't matter if I win it or I lose it. As long as I go through it godly. You wouldn't be so frustrated about your money, your finance, your family, your job. You're retired. If you looked at it, I'm just passing through. See, Abraham became great because he had that concept. I'm just passing through. Yeah, but you've been here 137 years. What's that compared to 40 million? Listen to this. When God called Abraham from the earth of Chaldeans. He literally uprooted him. And that uprooting was so divine. For the next hundred years, he said, I can't sink my roots anywhere permanent. Not in this world. Boy, this is... Don't you get what I'm trying to say? This is us. God called us out of darkness into His marvelous light. He called us out of death into life. He called us out of time into eternity. And we are sojourners and pilgrims. And we're just passing through. And we must guard against getting ourselves rooted. 
The only admonition I have for you is you are to be rooted and grounded in the truth. And the truth is not just a doctrine. The truth is a person. And his name is J-E-S-U-S. We are to be rooted and grounded in Him because He's not affected by time. Don't you get it? If your roots and my roots are in Jesus Christ, what does it matter if we get saved? What does it matter if we lose it all in the morning? If we're rooted in Him, He's the only thing that's unmovable. The Bible says in Hebrews, we have been appointed a kingdom that cannot be shaken, that cannot be uprooted, that cannot be moved. Oh boy. We must guard against allowing this world to become our home. While we sing about heaven, most of us are gripping this dirt pretty tight. While we sing those songs hypocritically, I give you all, Jesus, we're checking the interest rates to find out where to put our CDs. We must guard against pouring ourselves out for this world's toys and trinkets. Look here. Three things you need to grasp. We're listening for the sound of a trumpet. We're looking for the arrival of a Savior. And we're leaving for a city that will never pass away. Well, if I'm listening, and I'm looking, and I'm leaving, I ain't got time for grabbing. Pass through the land, pick up what I can use, leave what I can't use, and move on. The old timers used to sing a song, This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. Remember that song? Angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know, I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then, Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. And then we added a chorus and said, you want to bet, you want to bet, you want to bet? <laughs> Sometimes we make a little joke and say, wow, all this in heaven too. No. Not all this in heaven too. It's either or. We like to say, well, you can't take it with you. But we're holding on as if we think we could. Say, well, but preacher, you don't know when you're going to die. Then why worry? I hate to plan for 30 years and my time's up tomorrow morning. What a waste of thinking. There's people who spend their lives worrying about dying as if you could control it. And the Lord said, if you can't turn one hair black or white, why take your thoughts for other things? And if you can't add a cubit to your stature, why do you worry about other things? He's saying, you're being very ridiculous for a person that says they believe in God. We ought to be rooted and grounded in Him. I'm going to try this point again because I don't think you're appreciating what I'm saying. This man had a perspective about life. He had a concept about life. He told these people, I am a turner, a sojourner. I am a traveler. I am a stranger. They looked at him and said, man, you're a great monarch. You own a lot of real estate around here. You're a big kahuna. You're a sheik. You're a prince. You're a ruler. He said, no, no, I'm mobile, Jack. I'm passing through. I've been going for 137 years. I'm looking for a city. Our happiness leaves when we stop looking for the city. Read for me, Ray, if you would. My goodness. 
But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. Second Peter three eight. Yes, read. That one day is with the Lord is a thousand years, right. and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. Yes. But is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should men should come to repentance. Right, that's what God wants people to do. Repent. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Watch this. In the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise. Now the heavens are going to pass away. And we're spending billions of dollars to build a station on the moon, and the heavens are going to pass away. I really think a lot of these scientists are going to the moon because they've messed this up. This planet used to be a nice place to live. We got an, an ecological junkyard on our hands now. So we want to get to another planet to mess it up before the Martians get there. We're spending billions of dollars to explore outer space, and most people won't spend 30 minutes a day to explore inner space. And if this is all corrupt in here, I don't care how many planets you land on, you're going to louse that up. Because we are what we are inside. Trinkets and toys are just that. Trinkets and toys. They don't make us any better. Now maybe I'm, I'm going towards retirement or something. I remember how happy I was as a kid with a set of used Lincoln Logs. Has anybody here ever heard of Lincoln Logs? I mean, I didn't get them new. I got them. They were my brother Dickies. They just rewrapped them. Because you just had to have something at Christmas to open. And I got them Lincoln Logs that we played with for three years, but now they were mine. Amazing. Just played with Lincoln Logs. And now you got to have a $179 toy that takes 12 batteries and a German scientist to put it together and it lasts 11 minutes. And all our technological advances are really causing us a lot of frustration. Because when it's all said and done and all the wrapping paper's gone and everything's gone and the bills start coming in, you're not any happier. The simple things in life is the happy. A little bit of food, a little bit of love, a little bit of kindness, a place to sleep, and that's about it. Continue reading. They said the heavens are going to burn with fervent heat. The elements shall melt with a fervent heat. Now that's what's on this planet, the elements. And there's also elements in the atmosphere. They're going to burn with fervent heat. He's given us a science lesson here. God is going to cause combustion. All you need for a lot of combustion is a certain amount of water and a certain amount of nitrogen, and it's all held in suspension in the air. All God's got to do is strike the match. It'll go... God's got the elements hanging. That's why they're going to burn with fervent heat. He's just going to set it on fire. He's just got like a, like a gas bubble waiting just to set it on fire. Boom. And the whole thing's going to burn with fervent heat. And everything that we build here is just going to melt just like wax under a fire. And yet here we are acting like we're going to stay here forever. No wonder when you read the book of Revelation during the day of tribulation that the merchants and the great men of the earth do wail and bemoan and cry and slobber and carry on like a bunch of fools because they've lost everything that their life consisted of. Their commerce, their merchandise, their things that they lived for. They had no values past today. Read. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned Told up. you. Told you. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. Seeing all these things going to be dissolved, what manner of men ought we to be? In all holy conversation and godliness. Now, knowing that that's going to happen, what kind of perspective towards life should we have? Here's what we should have. Walk in the steps of Abraham. Enjoy whatever God lets you have. 
spend what you can, give what you can, bless who you can, but understand that you're looking for a city. You're moving through this little time zone, going to a place that will never dissolve and never pass away, that has no sunset, that has no rain, that has no sickness, that has no death. If you can look at that in that perspective, you can win in everything. Right. <laughs> Read, please. Looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of God, <coughs> wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved. Yes. And the elements shall melt with fervent heat. It's burning up. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, his promise, look for new heavens. New heavens. And a new earth. Wherein? Wherein dwelleth righteousness. righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things. Oh, wait, there's the key. He's assuming you're looking. Yeah. He didn't ask you to look. He assumes you're looking. He said, Beloved, seeing that you look for such things, what he's saying is, I can't believe a child of God would be looking any place else. I mean, that's like buying stock in the Berlin Wall. <laughs> I woke up to Brother Jim Evans. I said, Jim, I got a deal. I can get this stock on the Berlin Wall 10 for 1 shares. He says, uh, Brother Arnold, the Berlin Wall went down a little while ago. Doesn't matter. It's a good buy. <laughs> and and you, 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 you do just what you did. Oh, you got crazy. Well, wait a minute. Let me try it on you now. This whole thing's kitchen on fire. And everything's melted. And the whole democracy and the whole governmental system is going down the chute. Why would you invest in it? Why would you spend the greatest hours of your mind, the greatest time of your life, in playing games with trinkets and toys that are going to burn up? Why not give yourself to prayer and to fasting and to walking with Abraham's God and learning how to love His ways and to know His mind and to walk in His Spirit, knowing that we're going to go with Him and we're going to a place where that won't happen? Don't you see what I'm trying to tell you? Having that kind of perspective helps you and I go through setbacks. There should never be one situation in any of our lives that so devastates us that we stop praising and worshiping and loving God. You say, oh, you've never buried your loved ones. I've buried a few. You've never lost a lot of money. I've lost more money in this church than most of you spent. I've had more people borrow money and never paid it back. I've given tens of thousands of dollars to all kinds of things to help people that went down the tubes. Still talking tongues daily. Still jumping, bang around once in a while. I came here naked. I'm leaving that way. I'll tell you what really brought astounding coldness to my soul is when in San Diego we, we were there and they did that autopsy on that lady. Brother, when they brought that stiff out there and they're going to cut her up like a piece of liverwurst, I looked at Brother Larson and I said, you know, that's all there is to us now, isn't it? Just a little bit of tissue and some blood vessels and some organs and some bone and all your ego and all your pride and all your big deals and all your things you're worried about. You ain't nothing. You're just a piece of meat on an aluminum table or a stainless steel table and the people are digging into you and they're chopping you up to find out where it happened. Now you say, oh, that's so horrible, Brother Arnold. There's one waiting on you. When you consider the grandest thing you've got left that you're ever going to be cold with is the silk and velvet inside a coffin. That's it. And you won't even get to appreciate it because your eyes will be closed when they let you in there. Now let's be big boys and girls. We're facing the coffin. Or a hole in the clouds. And if we're facing that, what's the big deal if we lose three or four episodes? 
That doesn't give us a license to be irresponsible. We, we do have a scripture admonition to try to provide for our family and, and do stuff that's right. But I'm going to tell you something. We've got to be delivered from eating our fingernails to the elbow. Say, oh God, what, I don't know what am I going to do? Well, let's go get a fat free muffin and a cup of tea. Oh God, I just, I tell you, I don't know, the world's coming apart and, and you know, on this Gorbachev and now we got, Bush has got trouble. I don't know who's going to run for president and Kennedy might get off and uh, let's go to Ryan's and get some salad with some fat free dressing. Let's just, God, I got run into my car the other day and it's going to cost 216 bucks to fix the fender and, and the roof's leaking and uh, <laughs> what are we going to do? Let's go have some supper and let's just talk. What are you going to do? I'm to die with a full stomach. I'm for that. Well, I'm getting mixed signals back here, buddy. I get some of you sitting here doing this. I don't care how humorous he gets. He ain't getting the money. I'll, I'll work too hard, bless God. He's up to no good tonight. He can disarm the rest of them. He ain't disarming me. I ain't giving no more cheese for Christ. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but of the world. And the world passeth away in the lust thereof. But whosoever doeth the will of God, they abide forever. Did you hear me? Whosoever doeth the will of God, black and white, rich and poor, prisoner, ex-convict, murderer, it doesn't matter, cocaine addict, whosoever doeth the will of God, they abide forever. So keep trying to do the will of God. Keep trying to walk with God. If you make mistakes, ask God to forgive you and get up and walk again and plead the merits of the blood. Because whosoever doeth the will of God, it's going to abide forever. We need to understand what made Abraham so great. Oh, that if this earthly house of this tabernacle be dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Sometimes I, I, I really get concerned with myself and with you that, that we don't really believe what we say we believe. I'm not for this come see, come saw attitude, what'll be, what'll be. That, that sounds good on a record, but you're supposed to get your lazy carcass out of bed and go to work. And you're supposed to have some kind of frugality about your life. and You're not supposed to be a nincompoop. You are supposed to try to use your brain. But, Anything further than that, we're getting in very shaky, shaky, thin ice. Because we're doing crazy stuff that doesn't matter. I, I, I hate to bear uh, repeating this to you, but uh, in this lesson, it comes to me again. My, uh, all the struggling and all the sacrifice that my mother and father did to put the kids through school and do everything and do without this and do without and penny pinch and live on this and penny pinch and then all of a sudden out of cliff my mother gets breast cancer in two weeks she's dead as a hammer pow and Patty Arnold and I take my father to Miami to buy a new Pontiac Tempest and we drove his old beat up Pontiac home which we finally bought and I looked across at the red light and there for probably the third time ever in my life I saw my father crying and I said Patty look at dad he's, he's, he's crying he wasn't crying over buying a new car. He was crying over regret. Because he spent all this time doing without. Him and my mother didn't have this, couldn't do this, couldn't do that. And then all of a sudden, in one moment, she's dead. Pow! And now, it doesn't matter so much whether you make a payment or not. You 
see, life has a way of, of just awakening us to, you've got today, there is no tomorrow. And if I'm going to do good, I need to do it now. I can't wait till I'm good enough to do good. I need, if I'm going to love you, I need to love you now. I can't wait until everything is just right so I can say I'm sorry. No, I need to just walk up to you now and say, you know, I, I was very harsh the other day, or I was rude, or I was uncomfortable. I'm very sorry. And if my ears get red like getting hit by a snowball, and your face feels tingly and there's a butterfly in your stomach, that's just tough. You've got to take care of it. Because I watched the tears fall down my father's face. And in those tears I could see uh, ungiven apologies. Regrets of what could have been. And I looked at that and I said, by the help of God, I'm not going to do that. And I'm not going to hold on to this stuff until you've got to pry my fingers apart with a crowbar. I'm just going to hold it loose and just do what I can with it and, and I'm going to enjoy this day. Amen. Now you, you know, I'm, listen, I'm not a nature worshiper. I don't go out looking at spiders and butterflies and daffodils and all that kind of jazz. But, but I'm going to tell you something. We're living in momentous times and this generation is trying to pressurize us into this little mold of, 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 of tight-fisted, tight heart cold spirit, methodical mind, midget brain church people. And Jesus said, the love factor is what makes you known everywhere. That you're tolerant and you're understanding. Don't you understand you can be tolerant and not be in one iota agreement with somebody? But you tolerate. Don't you understand anything about loyalty? God, maybe I should have taught on loyalty. Do you understand that Jonathan was so loyal to his dad? And he, he was loyal to David and he was loyal to his dad. And he strengthened David's hand because he knew his dad was wrong. He said, my dad's wrong in this. David, you've taken my spot. I'm supposed to be the king, but you're going to be the king. And I recognize that. And I'll always be your friend. Swear to me that when I'm dead, you'll take care of my children. I'll do it. Okay. Why are you going to be with you? I've got to be loyal. Right. Amen. Now, let me just say something to some of you here. You're having a problem with this. When people that you love do stuff that you don't agree with, you must remain loyal. If not, you rape from them liberty. Don't you understand? If you don't have liberty, you can't be loyal. Listen to me. Let me give you a quick lesson here. Jesus sets us free so we can be loyal. But if He doesn't extend to us the freedom so we can choose to be loyal then we are nothing but slaves to His rule. Don't, don't you get it? Liberty is the base roots of true loyalty. Jesus sets us free and then commands of us, now be loyal because I've given you liberty. And sometimes you love somebody, you care about somebody, and they're deciding stuff that you are in disagreement with. You, you, you don't like the way your kids are doing it. You don't like the way your mom's doing it. You don't like... Fine. You might be 100% right that they're wrong. But if you turn your back on them, if you walk away and say, I can't stand with you. Why? Because I must control. Oh, no, 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 no. I stood with a bunch of you people in this church and I was against what you did. And I told you, I think this is bad. I think you're heading for trouble. But I didn't turn my back on you. And if you go down, I'll go down with you. But it's a tragic thing. It's prostitute loyalty. Because you don't want someone to have liberty. Oh boy, 
I got too much in my mind right now. Okay. Disregard previous statements. Jesus set me free and then demands of me loyalty. But he should never demand of me loyalty without first liberating me. If your son, your daughter, your family, your situation, if decisions are being made that you're not in agreement with, protest them. I think this is wrong. This isn't good. And then stand with them. If you don't stand, you're saying, I only stand with things I agree with. Don't you see what a church does to people? When you do things you shouldn't do and I jump all over you and I scream and get all red in the face and I say, don't do that. Yet you do it anyway. I stand with you. I talk to you. I don't go so. Don't you so. It's lonely, man. Don't you see? Elisha's whole future was contingent on one statement of loyalty. I'll not leave you. As the Lord thy God liveth and as my soul liveth, I'll not leave thee. Elijah offered him the liberty not to be inconvenienced. See, you got to offer the liberty. He offered it. Here, stay here. The Lord sent me here. I'm going with you. Thanks for the offer of liberty, but I'm taking the liberty and I'm going to be loyal. And with that loyalty that turned around, said, what do you want? He said, I want twice what you got. He said, okay, if you're that loyal, you see me when I'm gone, it secures your future. And it was his loyalty that got him his future. Amen. Even if it wasn't right for him to ask it. Amen. Well, I'm off on a tangent here now. Ruth is probably the most quoted woman in the Bible. Don't make me leave you, Naomi. Whether thou goest, I'll go. Where you dwell, I'll dwell. Where you die, I'll die. Where they bury you, they'll bury me. I'm sticking with you. But Naomi offered her the liberty to go home. Once the liberty is offered, if you choose to take that liberty and make it become loyalty... It'll do something great for you down the road. Because she has no grand guarantee that anything good's going to happen. She's a heathen. But her loyalty to Naomi reaches Boaz. Boaz loves her, marries her. He's a rich kinsman redeemer. But it all happens from being loyal. Okay. You see, that was my next point. I jumped ahead, I'm sorry. The thing that made Abraham great was he walked in the liberty of God and became loyal to God. He was loyal when he was the only one around that believed like him. He built altars in the face of false images and stayed loyal even when he was alone. I read it to you, Isaiah 51. I called Abraham alone. And I blessed him. And I multiplied him. But the blessing and the multiplying followed his willingness to be alone. And in that being alone, be loyal. Okay, I'm almost finished. Thank you for listening. Last, next to last point. The thing that made Abraham so fantastic was his faith. First, he loved. Remember, he loved. Secondly, he had the proper perspective. I'm a sojourner and a stranger. I'm just traveling through the land. Third, his faith in God. The promises made for his posterity. Whew, man, this is powerful. He gets ready to bury Sarah. 
in a land that God has given him and he's willing to pay for it. Because he says, my kinfolk down the road will get all my money back. I mean, you get what he's doing? He's buying land that God says, this is yours. But it's not his now. He's in a time factor. So he's buying in faith. I'll buy this burial plot for all my posterity to come down the road. Because God said, this is all mine. What made Abraham great? God was his faith. It was his faith. Think how strong his faith was. Usually when we get ready to bury our dead, if we have any kind of nostalgia, we bury our dead where our ancestors are. Americans are always taken off and going to those little quaint cemeteries in England to bury where their Uncle Joe was and their Aunt this and their what have you. And the Jews are always trying to go back, like that guy just now on the Maxwell guy going back to get buried in, in, in uh, Palestine. In the Mount Olives. My God, even salmon go back to get buried where it came from. I knew I'd reach you somewhere. But Abraham refused to go back. He said, I'm done with Haran. God has promised this land to me and my seed. So he buys it. And it's an interesting thing what it was. He bought the place that would be called Hebron. Hebron would become a city of refuge. So he buries his dead and Hebron becomes a place where folks can go so they don't get dead. Okay. Oh boy. His greatness was not from personality, it was not from ability, it was not from wealth or resource. His greatness came from his grand religious life. He lived close to God, he built lots of altars, he talked with God daily, he saw God as his almighty friend who cared. It was his faith in God that caused him to leave his home, that caused him to let Lot choose the best land, that allowed him to wait long, long, long years for the promised son. It was his faith that allowed him to dwell constantly in tents. He never attempted to return to the Ur of the Chaldees. It was his faith that kept him ever looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. It was his faith that he was willing to offer up Isaac and it was faith that made him buy the cave to bury Sarah. Because his faith said, we will own this land. Okay. Somebody say amen. Okay, I got three minutes. Second Peter 1, verses 4 through 8, are the seven Christian virtues. And it says, add to your faith. It wasn't just Abraham's faith. But you'll find these seven Christian virtues already in Abraham. He says, add to your, to your faith virtue. That means courage, purity. And he took servants and attacked the Assyrians and saved Lot. And add to your virtue knowledge. He spent his whole life being a student of God. And add to your knowledge temperance. That's self-control. He refused Sodom's gifts. He refused to get bent in a shape with the irritations of Lot's herdsmen. Strength of spirit is always in those who personally try to have more self-control before they deal out punishment. He says, add to your temperance patience. Hebrews 6.15 said he patiently endured. He waited long years. He waited long years. There's no record in these chapters that we studied of murmuring and complaining. It says, add to your patience, godliness. He built altars. He communicated with God. He constantly, in times of trouble, turned to his almighty friend. Add to your godliness, brotherly kindness. He was good and precious and kind and forgiving to Pharaoh and Abimelech and Lot. 
and add to your brotherly kindness charity, which is love. There is a total absence of petty pride. He paid full price to the Son of Heaven. He didn't haggle over a few dollars. The scripture says that finally in 25, we bury him now. We'll be out of here in two minutes. He gave up the ghost. Some people die fighting. Abraham just gave it up. He said, I'm finished. I've had enough. Let's get out of here. Took a deep breath. Went, oh, it's been a great life. See you. Let it sink in. He gave up the ghost. No struggle. He said, it's been a full life. It's been a good life. He affected his world with his greatness. Because these heathens said, thou art a great prince and chief among us. They never embraced his religion. He never fussed and cussed with them. He lived his life before God. Let them decide what they want to. You know what just told me? You can be a great person for God and be kind to people that never will embrace your way of life. Okay. He was gathered unto his people. Apparently many of the chieftains were there when they buried him. The interesting thing was the two brothers who hadn't seen each other for years, Isaac and Ishmael, show up at the funeral. So Abraham was great through his faith, and his faith was extremely tiny at the beginning. There was nothing extraordinary about his faith. But faith ties us to the Almighty God. Faith is the wire that lets the fire flow. God apparently seems to be able to grow any kind of crop he wants if he can only get the soil and the heart to cooperate. Would you stand with me? I'm finished. I'll tell you, we're out of here. One minute. I'm asking you in this final lesson of Abraham, why don't we yield ourselves to the heavenly gardener and allow him to fulfill in us his good pleasure? For he has planned something for each of our lives. Thus God will be glorified. We will be matured, fulfilled, and fruitful. He will receive pleasure from the development of our lives. And others will be helped by the fruit that is produced from our lives. End of lesson. We bury Abraham written on his tombstone that he might walk in the steps of the faith of Abraham. P.S. Is there anything too hard for the Lord? We bury a giant who started out as a midget but he walked with God. And he went through his tough times and his trials and he held everything very loosely. But the scripture says just before he dies, he gave everything he had to Isaac. Why? Because nobody owns anything. It just passes through your hands. Well, I've enjoyed 25 weeks. And I think maybe you're, you've had enough Abraham. But we needed this tonight. I needed this. We needed to see what made him great. Because if you're not careful, you walk out here saying, well, I don't have those kind of trials. No, it's not the situation. It's the person. The times change. The pressures change. But we in God, we just got to work these things out. Lord, I really do want to be great for you like Abraham. I I I'd like to be your friend. I know you called us in the New Testament. I called you friends. And I'd like to be an intimate friend with you. And I realize that doesn't come cheap. But I pray for my own outlook, mine, not, never mind these folks, mine, that I would not have this bulldog tenacity of, of holding on to every dime and worrying myself into an excedrin headache and, 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 and being all uptight and all upset. Lord, let me, let me wrench out of every day the last drop 
that I can bring you pleasure, that I can bless people that I come in contact with. I pray for this assembly. It's been a long, wonderful journey with your friend. God, I'm asking you to let these steps, these truths, somehow get down to the fiber of our souls. Deliver us from, from being small people. In Jesus' name. Go with us to our places of abode. In your name I pray. Amen. Let's sing that unto the Lord and we'll go. You're dismissed. Yeah, I'm